I'm so glad that the presence of the Lord is felt here in this place today. Amen. We're going to go to the Word of God. If you would turn with me to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter, is it that painful? I just heard a, oh, Matthew chapter 11. Oh, somebody's, okay, was it that hard to sit down? Okay, I know. Matthew chapter 11. Um, if you want to save a little time this morning, uh, you could look in advance to Luke chapter 10, 1 Corinthians 13, Luke chapter 10, 1 Corinthians 13, but our main text is still in uh, Matthew chapter 11. Father, we thank you for this day and your presence here in this place. We prepare our hearts and our minds and our spirits to be taught by Holy Spirit today. God, I thank you for the privilege, as Clifford mentioned earlier, he was thankful, and he thanked you for the privilege he has to lead in worship. I thank you for the privilege of being that mouthpiece, that, that conduit today, that Holy Spirit as an instrument can be used of you to bring forth your word today. But I pray that you would hide me behind the cross and let the words I speak not just be my own, but be yours today. That's what we must hear today, Lord. So I pray in my obedience that, Father, you would speak to us in this place and help us to change the ways in our lives that need changing, that we might be the man, the woman that you have called us to be. And I ask this in Jesus' name, and everybody can say amen. Talking to you about the rested man. And in this series, uh, we're not being, this is not gender specific. Uh, it is that you and I, as the people of God, we have a spirit, and it's referenced oftentimes as the spirit man, that which lives down deep inside of us. It's, uh, we have probably heard counselors and those in, with science and science degrees have talked about the psyche. Your psyche is, uh, is, is, is who you are. It is um, who you are and why you think the way you think why and how you process things and your psyche is attached to your spirit and so we're talking about being rested in our spirit because being rested in our spirit impacts everything else about us it's virtually impossible to be rested in our emotions to be rested physically and even mentally if we are not rested in our spirit and that's what we have been talking about I'm looking forward to to bringing this seventh message I might go for a record in this series I think uh, uh, the seventh message in the series and we do have a little farther to go uh, because we're talking about the Beatitudes which are in uh, Matthew chapter 5 I'm going to get there in just a moment but let me just say this uh, if this is the first message in this series that you have been a part of um, all of them are on our, our website um, npag.cc you can also find them in the raw on our, our Facebook page which basically is the entire service but if you want to hone in to just the message um, that would be on our our website but let me just give you a little bit of a foundation We've been talking about um, being tired. Anybody tired this morning? Look at all the honest hands. We do get tired. We get tired from work. We get tired from family responsibilities. We get tired from, you know, maintaining a home. Uh, some of you are continuing education, actually several of you. I know that you are continuing your education while working 40 plus hours a week. We get tired. We have financial worries. We experience sickness. All of these things, they drain on us. They, they pull on us. Physical pain, illness, uh, taking so care of someone who is ill, mental health. Poor mental health has a way of, come on, help me here, draining on us. Or maybe you live with someone who who suffers with some mental health issues, that can be draining on you as well. Relationships, marriage, uh, parenting, friendships, co-workers, employees, uh, the people you work with, your employer, employer, and employee, all of these relationships, they, they, we go through seasons of struggle and challenges and they can, they can, they can drain us, struggles with hurts, 
hang-ups, habits of life. And if you're a Christian, how many Christians here today? Okay, three or four. What an altar call we're going to have at the end. Woo! Uh, if you're a Christian here today, if you're a Christian leader, a churchgoer, Christian, or a Christian leader, I, I think we understand today that the family of God is under brutal attack. And we can't help in this fight that we're in because we fight not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this world. It's, it's not just a physical fight, it's a spiritual fight. But oftentimes, emotionally and physically, as Christians and spiritual leaders, we are reeling we are, some, we are being drained at times of our very strength that can leave us in a place of being tired. There's lots of reasons why we can be tired. And it's for this cause that we have turned to the scripture where Jesus said, Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Come to me all who are weary and burdened, and I, read the rest of this with me, will give you rest. We've learned some things through the series. Real quick, who have I got back there? I think it's Mackenzie Tharp, right? Miss Mackenzie, fly with me here, dear. Here we go. Some things that we have learned. We've learned that if you want to be rested, I already commented on this, you've got to be intentional about resting your spirit. Because out of your spirit comes life, okay, or rest, okay? We've talked about God's plan to rest your spirit, what is God's plan to rest your spirit? His plan to rest your spirit is through whole living. There's principles in his word, specifically the Psalms and the Proverbs, on how to please God and get along with man. And a lot of times, our pleasing God, either we're in obedience or not, when, when I'm in disobedience to the things of God, come on, I can be the most tired. I can, I can be experiencing the most weight, not only on my physical and my emotions, but of course that's coming from my spirit. And the same with others. You know, I'm not, we're not talking about, you know, being a doormat or, you know, just, you know, always being somebody's punching bag. That's not what we're talking about. But there is a part of you and I being able to get along with people we live with. And I feel bad. Don't look around. Maybe those people aren't here today, but don't look around anyway. I feel bad for people who they've always got to fight with somebody. They're, they're, some, they're not only depressed, but they're some of the most weary, tired people that I have ever met. They're tired about this. They're tired from that. They're frustrated about this, and they're frustrated about that. And most of the times, it's because they're attached to a relationship issue whether it's someone they're married to or their brother or their uncle or their boss or a uh, co-worker. They're, they're always at it with somebody. Uh, I think nowadays we call that drama. Yes, <laughs> I heard that, yes, and I'll throw in two, yes. What are... Where are the ingredients of what we've been talking about? Jesus, he takes a group of simple people just like you and me who, who are subject to all the things in this life that can wear us down. And he gathers with a group of disciples which turned into a crowd of people, Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. And he begins to pour into them. Now this is like the third sermon series in six years that I've been here that I've used the Beatitudes, and I've taken a Beatitude, or, you know, as Jesus talks about specific attitudes to be, we'll say that, and, and I've kind of given it um, a little bit of a, a little spin. Um, this is the third time I've done this, so we're, we're looking and going to be, we're, I think we're at like number five now, with three more to go, we're looking at each of the things that Jesus said at his Sermon on the Mount, that he spoke, and I'm assigning a rest ingredient, or ingredients to rest, to each of these beatitudes that Jesus shares with us. 
So this is where we are so far. I'm going to read the beatitude or the attitude to be, and I'd like for you to read the ingredient. Okay, we ready to do this? The first one that Jesus says in Matthew 5, 3, okay, is he says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Rest ingredient number one is? The next one, blessed are those who mourn, Matthew 5, 4. The rest ingredient number two is? <laughs> I love some people are like, really? <clears throat> and others are like, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, Matthew 5, 5, Jesus says, blessed are the meek. Rest ingredient number three is? Oh boy, this next one got us last week, didn't it? Uh, 5, 6, Matthew 5, 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Rest ingredient number four. Yes, you are. If you want to be, you can be. And here's where we are today. We're at this, at this uh, fifth Attitude to be, be attitude of Jesus. Fifth thing that I believe you and I can, we can look at this, this verse, we can look at what this means, and I've, I've assigned a, a ingredient to this as well. Read it out with me, uh, that this, or you can just do the ingredient. Matthew 5, 7, blessed are the merciful. Rest ingredient number five is? I'm compassionate. How do we get that? rest ingredient. Well, the word mercy, or mercy, which is where merciful comes from, in the Greek uh, is the Greek word eleos, E-L-E-O-S. This is a really, really neat word because out of the translation of this, when we look it up uh, from the Greek, it, it actually gives the connotation of compassion. Uh, but it's a little bit, but I, I like this. Uh, when you look it up, it, it, it says this. I, I think I put the definition up right up here for you. It, it's a, especially when, especially when the affliction is undeserved. Now, I, I really had to think about that. And, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know. Can I just, spiritually speaking, I'm like, like really spiritually speaking, I, I'm not sure that there's really anything in life that comes to us that's really like undeserved. Um, and I, I'm not trying to be, you know, negative Ned here today. I, I'm not. I, I'm just saying, guys, we live in a sinful world. Amen? Okay. And as I look at the world around us, I realize that, I not only make choices today, but I made choices two years ago, five years ago, I'm a really old man, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. What are you laughing at? Some of you are a lot older than I am. Keep going, 40, 50, right? There's choices and decisions that we make. Now listen, I'm thankful for the grace of God. You've heard me talk about this before. And, and the grace of God, the grace of God is, is, is getting something from him that we don't deserve. It's like if you got stopped by one of Pekin's finest police officers and you unroll your window with that disgust on your face, like, oh, what did I do? And he or she leans down and passes you a $100 bill. That's the definition of grace. Is getting something that you didn't do anything. Someone's thinking, man, if that's happened to you, preacher, I'm going to speed more often here in town and get. I, I don't suggest that, but but that's grace. Grace is getting something you don't deserve. Now, mercy is a little bit different. Mercy is not getting something you do deserve. Mercy is when you're speeding. And the police officer stops you, he or she comes up to your window, you roll down the window, oh, and you do your little back and forth, and he or she says, I'm letting you off today, have a good day, slow it down. That's mercy. Now, we have to apply spiritually the work of Jesus Christ to our lives, grace and mercy. Because everything that is deserving 
Jesus took upon himself. We deserve nothing. If, hey, come on, help me. We're just looking at this from spiritual application. We deserve nothing. Jesus paid the price so that we could have everything. We have been given something that we don't deserve. You can't work for it. You can't earn it. And we don't deserve it. Jesus gives it to us freely for all who would accept and believe. So I'm thankful. But when I looked at this definition, and this is just a raw definition, guys, that I, I, I pulled out of, I don't know, one of my computer programs to define the Greek word mercy, compassion, especially when the affliction is undeserved. All right. Now, now that I said what I did to begin with, I, I, I can say this. I could ask this. Do you have a heart that really feels badly when others are going through some chaos and crazy and pain in their life? Do, do you have a heart like that? Okay, a handful of people. Uh, it, really now, we're going to dig a little bit deeper here. Be, because let me, let me just, can I be transparent and don't you dare do an ah, bah, shame on you. Did you ever do this? Um, this is like an old, did you guys do this? If you're 50 and over, you probably know what this means, right? Did, yes, no, it does, maybe it was a northern thing. Was it a Catholic thing? Uh, I, okay, it was a Catholic thing. Ah, bah, shame on you. But I, I'm just going to be honest. Uh, uh, and, 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 and we're all wired differently. We all have different pasts. We all had different raising and rearing. We've all had different experiences in life. This is an area of my life that I have to keep in check. And I'm just being transparent with you. I have to keep this in check in my life for myself, but also for others. Because here's the deal. There is a need in our world, and I don't know if I put this down as a PowerPoint or not, Mackenzie. If I didn't, I should have. There is a need in our world today for people who are compassionate towards others. But listen to this. Even when it seems like they're digging their own grave. Uh, it's one thing. Come on. I get it. Compassion is looking at he or she. Are you following they're undeserving of that. Nobody should have to. I get that. But I also understand the world we live in today and the choices that we make and the paths we choose and some things happen to us because we've chosen a wrong path somewhere along the way. Some things happen to us just because we live in a fallen world. I'm looking at people today and rewind many of you back to your childhood. You didn't deserve to be abused by your mother or father. You didn't deserve to be bullied by someone that now it's had like a, almost as lasting impact. You didn't deserve that. I get it. Undeserving. But this really takes it to another whole level, this compassion. Blessed are the merciful. Are you getting me? People make poor choices. They lie. They make poor money decisions. They make poor sexual decisions. Alcohol, drugs. They make poor choices spiritually by getting involved with occultic practices. And here's one of my things. I'm going to be a little transparent with you. When people have been exposed to God... And some folks raised in church and exposed to God for a lot of years. But yet, somewhere along the way, they turn their back and walk away. That's, that's my deal. And I have to deal with that. Hello. See, I, I, deal, I deal with a lack of compassion. I'm just being, is it okay to be honest? Or would you rather me lie? Okay, thanks. This crowd would like me to be truthful. I, I struggle when a person should know better, and they don't. They've been raised. I know how they were raised. I, I, I know their story. Why are they acting like this? Why are they having that attitude? They should know better. 
And so I'm reading this, and I'm going to get into some things here. I have to move along to really help us understand where and how this affects our rest. Because right now, it really kind of seems like we're talking about everybody else around us, right? It's having this, this, this merciful but being compassionate towards people. When, when things are happening in their lives, when they're deserving it, when we, oh, should I say, when we think they deserve it, don't look around, keep looking it up here at me. This is not a week I have time. I don't have time for like 12 counseling sessions this week. Uh, just keep looking right up here at me. Uh, we look at people, whether they're, they're undeserving or whether in our minds they deserve it, they're getting just what they deserve. There will always be people who throw away opportunities. They abuse other people's generosity. They neglect help when real help is laid out before them. And there will always be people who, regardless of how long they've been in church, doing the Christian, you understand the quotes, right? The Christian thing. Who will reject God? Our world is in need of people who are compassionate. Now, here it is. Here's the exposure of the Word of God to us today. Because this, guys, is not just so that somebody else might be so blessed to have you know, an Ashton or a Kendra or, or a Joe or a Frank. They're so blessed to have a Ryan in their life. <clears throat> Being a man or a woman of compassion not only benefits others, but it brings blessing to your life. What you think about this? And this is how, you may want to write this, that maybe I have this point. Because this is, this is what I felt Holy Spirit spoke to my heart this week. Is that being a compassionate person has a way of detangling things inside you. It has a way of detangling things inside of us. You'll be, listen, now hold on, come on. Grab your chair, pull your seatbelt over, do whatever you got to do. This is the bad time to go out. And use the bathroom. Just letting you know. Bad time to leave. Don't leave right now. Hold it. Hmm. You'll be less assuming, less judgmental. I, I, I have to read these because I'm, I'm writing these down. And I, I memorize about 60 to 70% of my sermon. But the things I have written this week, it's hard to get all these things in my, in my heart in the order that I wanted them. You'll be less assuming, less judgmental, less critical, less angry. And free from hoping that people get what they deserve. A lot of things, hear me guys, a lot of things can keep us all knotted up inside. You go through a lot of things, I go through a lot of things, we're involved in a lot of things, challenges, circumstances, issues, many of them unfavorable. All, that big list I read from the beginning, illness, taking care of someone in your home who is ill, your own personal mental health, living with someone who's having mental health issues, working, education, children. I mean, the, all, listen, we have all these things today that can apply pressure to our lives and make us tired. I say this every week. I don't want to leave it out. There's people who are home today, not in church worshiping because they're tired. They get up this morning and made the decision, I'm not going to church because I'm tired. Matter of fact, some are so tired, they're not even watching it online right now. I mean, that's got to be the epitome of tired. You can't even go out in your skivvies and with a coffee and a Twinkie and sit there in the living room and watch this. That's the epitome of tired. And it goes beyond that because they might not even lift this up in the course of a week. It is tired. I'm tired. Can't do devotions. Can't. Oh, I'm tired. I'm not making fun. 
I'm being real. Because all of this spiritual stuff that we avoid is making us more tired, more unrested. All of these things. It's making us more assuming. We're not feeding the right thing first. It's making us more assuming, more judgmental, more critical, more angry. But this one, this this attitude to be, this ingredient for rest called compassion is huge. Because an attitude that people should get what they deserve is toxic to the core of our psyche. Which is attached because it's how it's who we are, how we think. It's attached to our spirit. Compassion. So all of these things that Jesus is talking about, he says in this seventh verse, blessed are the merciful. Now listen, you know, there were those that were there and got to hear it. We have like three chapters of notes. This was a two or three day sermon from Jesus, the Sermon on the Mount. He shared a lot of things. Oh my, what a day that will be when we can, you know, have a little visitation with Jesus Maybe we have a little visitation with someone who is there, and we can say, hey, what do you remember from the Sermon on the Mount? How much did he say about mercy? How much did he say about compassion in those, in those messages? Because from the Greek, that's what it translates to. It translates to compassion. And the compassion. Jesus knew this, guys. He knew that it had a unique way of maximizing our headspace where we can welcome more hope and peace and have a liberated mind, liberated emotions, liberated spirit. He just, he knew this. He knew that's how it worked. And he knew that in order for you and I to have a truly rested spirit that in turn would rest our emotions and even rest us physically. And when all demands Think about it. Jesus knew the 21st century was coming. 21st century living in life didn't take God by surprise. He knew exactly what you and I needed. And he invested everything into a Savior who Jesus says, Are you tired? Are you heavy? Are you burdened? Come to me. And read it with me. Now you know it. Say it out loud. And I will give you Rest, I'll give you rest. Oh, I long for one of those come to Jesus meetings where he holds me in his arms and says, It's going to be okay, my son. It's going to be okay, my daughter. You're weary, you're burdened, you're tired. He might even say, Some of it's undeserved. Some of it is deserved. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I, I had to go there. But it's in this come to Jesus meeting. Do, do we understand? Do we understand what a come to Jesus meeting looks like? Hello? Hello. That sounded tired. Hello. Sounds like Chewbacca. I can't do it, but some people can do Chewy really well. Anybody do, anybody do Chewy, Chewy? Yeah, thank you. There you go. Somebody from the worship team. You would expect them to do great things with their pipes. You would expect them <laughs> to do that. But what does this come to meeting, come to Jesus meeting look like? I'm tired. I need rest. And and, do you know in six years, I I should have started with this series. (laughs) Blame it on the Lord. I I should have started with this message series six years ago. But I've had people literally say, Pastor Darren, this is like one of the most challenging. This is one of the the most uh, series I I, I think I've ever heard you share. And, of course, when a pastor hears that, you're thinking about, you know, all the other sermons you've preached that maybe they didn't like. But, but anyway, this, this series just has, really seemed to have a lot of people's attention. 
but what do we do? Like, we're here today. Yes, I qualify for what you're talking about. What does this come to Jesus meeting look like? I, 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 I hate to be the bearer of this news, but there's no magic pill. He doesn't take you in, your, in his arms, whisper a little bit in your ear, and, and send you off. You might still feel unrested. Oh, that's not why I came to church today. And unfortunately, that's what keeps some people away from church. Unfortunately, that's what keeps some people away from God. Because they give them a chance. Come on, I'm reading somebody's email right now. They gave them a chance. They gave God a, God a chance. They, you gave the church a chance. Okay. You gave God a chance. You gave the church a chance. Who, who, who's to say that God didn't do all that God could? <laughs> who's to say the church didn't do all the church could? The question is, did you do everything you could? But yet we turn our back, we walk away from God, we walk away from the church, we blame somebody, and the pastor makes a good target, by the way, in case you didn't know. Pastors make great targets for the unaccomplished work of God in your life. Just blame me. Blah, 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 blah. That's exactly what some people are hearing right now. You don't want to hear this because it makes you accountable. Man, Holy Spirit, open up ears in this place today and every demon in hell that has appointed, been appointed to this service to interrupt, to distract and hinder, we curse you back to the belly of hell from whence you came in Jesus' name. Open our spirits so that we can hear today, God. What did I do? See, there's something that you do have to do. It's a huge misconception for you to think that coming to Jesus is simply a magic pill and that his transformation requires nothing from you. That's not the deal, guys. Jesus was the one who signed the covenant between you and God. And the covenant of God says that God is going to keep up his part. He will not let down and one, God will do what God said he will do. But in the context of what you and I are talking about right now, it is free. It is a free gift from God. I mean, it's not really a free covenant because the covenant with God had to, it cost, it cost heaven everything. It cost heaven Jesus. And Jesus gave his very life and signed the contract. He, he was the contract signer. He was, he's, is the high priest. Uh, in, in accordance to, to priesthood, he, he is the highest. He, he is the one who bridged the gap between God and man. And in the contract, God says, this is what I will do. But for you and I to think that there's no responsibility on our part, that is a huge misconception. And I'm sorry. No, I'm not. <laughs> you have no right to blame the pastor. You have no right to blame the youth pastor. You have no right to blame church leadership. You have no right to blame any church. You have no right to blame any Christian. If you are not in a place receding from God, the contract and the contractual agreement and the blessings and the thing that comes out of the flow of the blessings of God, it's nobody's fault but your own and my own. And I've lived times, patches, and periods of my life. I've lived outside that contractual agreement. And so have you. And here's one of those things. I've got to speed this up a little bit here today. That when Jesus says, come to me, he gives us these attitudes. Really, he does. He says, have the attitude. I can't do this on my own. 
cancels out pride and arrogance and self-sufficiency. He says, he says, have the attitude, blessed are those who mourn. I'm emotional, but I got this. What's that saying? I'm weak, but he's strong. It's take on the attitude, I'm striving for a balanced life. It's taken on the attitude, I'm in control of my thought life. God is gracious. God is merciful. You know, I've said this, I think I started out saying this when I was a youth pastor, and that was a long time ago, and it was only for a year because I was a terrible youth pastor. I mean, I was right out of Bible college. I really was. I was right out of Bible college, and I mean, I wanted to preach expositional, hermeneutical, theological sermons to these youth. And I did that. And, and you should have seen their faces. <laughs> and I couldn't understand what was wrong. And I realized I figured it out. Well, okay, God didn't call me to be a youth pastor. God called me to be a lead pastor. So then I took my first church as a lead pastor. What do you think? I <laughs> 32 years later. <laughs> You're still, <laughs> I'm kidding, uh, but I, I used to say, I, I, now I lost my train of thought, I used to say, what was it I used to say, huh, somebody help me, the help that I need doesn't exist, okay, I heard somebody say that, no, uh, I, I, okay, let's just move on, I'm, I'm in control of my thought life. Oh, that's where I was. I'm in control of my thought life. I am having an old age moment right now. And Ed's here today and he's thinking, Preacher, you have no right to think you're having an old age move moment right now. It's good to see you, Ed. One of, one of our dearest and, and happens to be one of our senior, senior saints here at this church. But Jesus also says to be compassionate. It detangles. We come to Jesus, and we have to ask for healing from our hurt. I don't know if I can. I'm going to have to wrap this up. Oh, my gracious. How did I do this? I've got two and a half more pages of notes, and I just I can't do it to you today. Thank you, preacher. Some of you are getting emotional right now. Some of you feel it's mercy. <laughs> Others of you think it's grace. I'll take whatever I can get. But I, I, I got to give this to you. Because, see, for some of us, the reason why we struggle, we struggle with this compassion that Jesus wants us to have that kind of goes beyond the norm, the, the normal thinking of today, and says that, that this mercy, this compassion is freeing yourself from the idea and the thought that a person, whether you know them or not, should get what they deserve because they're digging their own grave. And, and some of you struggle with that because of some deep hurts and wounds in your life. Now here's something that Jesus can do. When you have a come to Jesus meeting and he takes you in his arms, he can help you to begin to feel better. Hmm. He can help you to feel better from your hurts, your wounds. But then, when Jesus whispers in your ear, some of that come to Jesus meeting, which by the way, your come to Jesus meeting, some of that is some of that is some of that is uh, your church life. It's learning and growing. It's 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 being in church, being in small groups, being with groups pockets of believers who can edify, encourage, and build up. And it's part of that growth because you know when we jump down out of the lap of our Father. And he always goes with us. But when we go out here and we start doing this life, see, that, that toxic, those toxic attitudes and those toxic ideas, 
he wants to help us with because a lot of those things are bringing the unrest to our spirit that we want healing from. Um, I'm going to ask, hey, I didn't even prepare you for this. Let's see. I think I meant to text you. Does that count if I meant to text you? Henry and Lola. It, what? <laughs> I want you guys to come on up here. And we're gonna, this is the last thing we're going to do today. It's 1130. Um, a couple microphones here. I think I was told to tell you to grab that mic and that mic. And you have no idea what you're going to do. But you are such wonderful servants of the Lord. You'll do anything your pastor asks you to do. Why don't you guys come stand right at this table. So, um, and I'm, Clifford was waiting for that. He was waiting for that moment um, for when the worship team was supposed to come. I'm not even going to get to that moment, so this is... Um, I'm more prepared at, can I just really just all of your attention that you possibly can give me right now for these last couple of minutes because I am more prepared today than ever before in my life to talk about what this come to Jesus meeting should look like when you and I are looking for rest in our spirit when it comes to this idea of compassion, which Jesus says, blessed are the merciful. This toxic idea and thoughts that sets you in opposition with people. He or she's digging their grave. They deserve to lay in it. No. No. Whether they do or they don't, that's really not up to you. That's up to the Heavenly Father to decide. You and I have got to wash our hands. Hear me. We've got to wash our hands. And in this, I guess I'm saying, we've got to wash our minds of this toxic attitude that is compassionless. Because compassion is part of your healing. Compassion is part of your hope. Compassion is part of what Jesus wants to do in you to get you the kind of rest that you're after. There's eight different rest ingredients. And if I haven't gotten you with the first four, I'm hoping I've gotten you with the fifth. But it's okay. I've got three more to go in the weeks to come. But my Lord, all eight. Eight of them are ingredients that the come to Jesus meeting is what Jesus wants to do in us. And these things don't happen overnight. They take time. They take living it out, fleshing it out, thinking it out, praying it out, successes, failures. It takes coming to the altar and being broken before God. So here it is. Here's the caboose. I am more equipped today than ever before in my life to answer this question. Preacher, how do I find healing in my wounded, broken spirit? Things that happened to me in the past that have hurt me and wounded me and broken me. Some of the toxicity in my life, my ideas about others, my opinions about others, I know today, I'm listening to this sermon, preacher. I know it comes. My compassionlessness, compassionlessness. My lack of compassion. It's hurting me. I want you to listen to the reading of this. Matter of fact, Henry is going to read a step. And Lola will lead us in the scripture. Can we do it that way today? And you know, it's going to be on, it'll be up, it'll, at least we'll be up here behind you if you can't see that there. Okay. But I want you to watch this because I'm more convinced than ever before in my life. And I'm not here to preach, celebrate, or preach or try to shove, uh, celebrate recovery down anybody's throat. But I'm going to tell you something. Celebrate recovery, as far as I'm concerned, in the past six years, 
has been one of the greatest gifts that God has given this church when it comes to ministry. Now, we're getting a few amens, and some of you have no idea because you still have no idea what it's all about. But if you're sitting here this morning, and this message is tugging at your heart in the slightest, and I'm not here to promote and say, I am here to promote the gospel. But watch this, because these are the things for the past year and a half, some of us have been reminded about every single week for a year and a half. Our two-year celebration will be October of this year. Some have joined us along this journey, but every single week we talk about these things. Go ahead and bring this home for us, guys. Henry's going to read the step, and, and you will read. How about we read with Lola, and Lola will lead us in the scripture. Okay? Go right ahead. Miss McKenzie, we have to wait on you. Yep, make sure those mics are on, guys. See a little light there somewhere. On but not working? Oh, got a good green light. Hello, hello. Check, 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 check. Checks in the mail. One, two, three. Check. Is that one good? Black mic. This is my mic. Black mic? Check, 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 check. Oh, there. that's why, because he said don't give yours away. That's my bad. I need you up here, Clifford, and I also need Jen. Here, let's do this again. That was my bad. Poor Keith's back there sweating bullets down the side of his face because I took the wrong microphone. <laughs> okay, here we go, guys. Sorry, I meant I really wanted to be done by 1130 today. I need nine minutes of grace. Here we go. Okay, step one. He reads. You listen. We admitted we were powerless over the, our addictions and co compulsive behaviors that our lives had become unmanageable. Now join Lola on all these scriptures. I know that nothing, nothing good, good lives, lives in me that, that is in my sinful nature. nature for I have the desire to do what is good, but, but I, cannot I cannot carry it out. It. Romans 7, 18. Step two, we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. For it is God who works in you to do the will of acting of his will for good. His God and his purposes for you. Philippians 2.13. Step three, we made a decision to turn our wills and our lives over to the care of God. Step four, we made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Let us examine our ways and test God, and let us return to the Lord. Lamentations 3.10. Step five, we admitted to God, our, our, to ourselves and to another human being, the exact nature of our wrongs. Step six, we were entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of our character. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. James 4.10 Step seven, we humbly ask him to remove all our shortcomings. Step eight, we made a list of all persons who we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Do unto others as you would have them do to you. Luke 16, 5. Step nine, we made direct amends to such people whenever possible, except when to do so would injure them or ourselves or others.
step 10, we continue to take personal inventory and we were wrong and promptly admitted it. Step 11, we sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and power to carry that out. Step 12, having had a spiritual experience as a result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to others and to practice these principles in all of our affairs. Others, if you sell your gifts, are considered you are spiritual and should restore them gently. But watch yourselves so you may not be tempted with the temptations of swine. Yeah, hold that right there, Mackenzie, if you wouldn't mind. Brothers, sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, the first thing that comes to mind when you think of that. Aha! Uh-uh. Trapped. In a pit. Can't get out on their own. Now the caution here is be careful because it's easy sometimes to get dragged down into people's pits if you're not careful. But it doesn't take away the responsibility that you and I are people who are supposed to be helping people out of pits. Stand with me today. Bless you guys. Thank you. Henry Lola, love you. Thank you. Give me a big I love you. Yep. Okay. Um, let's do this. Uh, Jen, this is one of those moments in church where it's like, you know, like, I, I know what I want to give for an altar call, but there's that side of me that says, are people really willing to admit that that's their issue? Are, are they are they just waiting for the somebody to close? Let, let Clifford sing the last song so I can get out of here. I'll take my conviction. I'll take it home. going to do with it? Like, man, if Holy Spirit's been dealing with you this morning in any way, shape, or form that, hey, Darren, that's you. You need more compassion in your life, and you, Darren, are messing up the flow of the healing that I want to do in you with an attitude of being merciless and not having enough compassion. Again, this might not be your deal this morning, and that's okay. There's a lot of attitudes. There's a lot of rest ingredients in this series. So, But this is one of them that's important. And somebody here today, you have just... Holy Spirit has literally walked into this place, and He's opened up a door, and He said to somebody, possibly more than one person, there's the exit. Rest. You, you've been asking me for rest. You've been asking me for peace. You've been asking me for freedom. You've been asking me to get out of this pit of some of your behaviors and some of your ideas and your attitudes. And Holy Spirit has walked in this place over the last 45 minutes and He's opened up a door and He said, there's the exit. Come on. He's saying, come on. Come on. Come on. Here's the exit. Come on. change that song sometimes we should change it from come to the altar we should change it to uh, grab your coat and your purse and your shoes <laughs> there's the back door don't be confused oh go with your bourbons oh 
I'm standing here before you today, guys, but I'm, I'm on both knees in my spirit. And I'm pleading you and I'm begging with you today that your freedom for some, the door, the exit's right there. So uh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to ask. I mean, if somebody wants to come after, after I pray, you want to come and get special prayer, you're more than welcome. We'll find people and I myself will pray for you. But there may be some who need to leave, who need to slip out, and that's okay too. But Lord, I ask today, whose freedom, whose freedom is on the line this morning, God? Who is it? Who is it as Holy Spirit showed an exit sign and said, the way out is for you to ask me to help you with the lack of mercy and the lack of compassion that you have in your life for others? because it's being toxic to you. You're not just hurting others, you're hurting yourself. Who is it, God, that you've prepared the way for today? Is it me? Speak to my heart, change my life, change my mind. I ask God that every man, every woman in this place today that's heard this message that, Lord, their hearts would be soft toward what you want to do. Jesus. Jesus. This could be one of the most important come-to-Jesus meetings that some have ever had in their lives. Aside from maybe the day when they became a Christian or or said they wanted to serve you, uh, that, that... obviously is, is vital and that is that is the thing which we look for but the ongoing growth and the ongoing transformation is what keeps us from falling back into old pits and old snares and old traps and old hurts and so today God I'm just asking and pleading God today Holy Spirit do a work that I can't do but I certainly feel I feel in the realm of the Spirit today what you're wanting to do in lives in this place. And I pray, God, that you've hidden me behind the cross and that words that I have spoken have not just been mine but yours and that somebody today will come to an altar and find the hope and the healing and the help. this in Jesus' name. I say amen.